G'day everyone and welcome to the second video in week 10 of our admin law course. This week we're looking at the Ombudsman and in the first video we learned that the Ombudsman's role is to investigate on behalf of ordinary people who have a complaint about a government decision. We learned that the Ombudsman relies on influence rather than power and that they obtain that influence as a result of their independence and as a result of their capacity to report directly to Parliament. Now we've already learned that the Ombudsman is a statutory position. In other words, it was created by statute. There was no such thing as an Ombudsman until along came the Ombudsman Act and then suddenly there was an Ombudsman. So as we've learned time and time again in this course, if we want to learn the powers of the Ombudsman, we should start by looking at the statute. Section 5 of the Ombudsman Act sets out the functions of the Ombudsman. There are two super interesting aspects of this section that I want to talk about. The first one is that subsection 1a gives the Ombudsman the right to investigate an action that relates to a matter of administration. Now at first it might not be obvious why this matters, but it's so much broader than the ADJR Act. Think about it, under the ADJR, you can only get a review of a decision of an administrative nature made under an enactment. The Ombudsman isn't restricted to looking at decisions, they can look at any action. Second, the decision or the action doesn't have to be of an administrative nature. It merely has to relate to a matter of administration. Finally, they're not restricted to decisions under an enactment. As long as the action relates to a matter of administration, that's enough. So the Ombudsman's field of interest, if you like, is much broader than the ADJR Act. The second interesting aspect of this section is that the Ombudsman may, of his or her own motion, commence an investigation. The Ombudsman does not need to wait for a complaint to be made. Again, that's super different to anything under the ADJR Act. So let's assume the Ombudsman has either received a request to investigate or they've determined on their own motion to investigate a matter. The Ombudsman is then given quite amazing investigative powers. We saw last week that the ability to obtain information about a decision is absolutely crucial when it comes to holding government decision makers to account. However, at the same time last week there was an entire video looking at exceptions to those rules, things you can't get access to. And in many cases, as I described last week, there were quite sound rationales for those exceptions. However, many of those rationales simply don't apply to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman is a Commonwealth public servant. So if they see people's private information, or if they see internal working documents or commercial in confidence stuff or national security stuff, where's the harm? It's just one more government agency looking at government documents. The risk doesn't occur until those documents are released outside the government. As a result, the normal rules of freedom of information just simply don't apply to the Ombudsman. Section 9 of the Ombudsman Act allows the Ombudsman to simply demand from any person, whether they're in the government or not, they can demand any information and any documents and any records which are relevant to an investigation. Really broad powers. Now that doesn't mean the Ombudsman is going to show those documents to you, but imagine this situation. Let's go back to the passport application example that we've used from time to time in the course. Your client comes to you because they've applied for a passport and their application has been rejected. You've obtained a statement of reasons, but it wasn't much help. And then you've run an FOI claim, obtained a couple more documents, but they were heavily redacted. After all of that, you're still not really able to advise your client whether the decision to reject their passport application was made properly. And so you go to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman accepts the case and runs an investigation. Some time later, they come back to you. The Ombudsman reports that they've looked at the application process, including the materials that couldn't be released, 
and in their view, the application for a passport was properly rejected. At that point, at least you know that someone independent, someone without a stake in the argument, has seen all the materials, including the materials you can't see. Your client still hasn't got the answer they want, but they can have much more confidence that this wasn't all just a big mistake or someone out to get them. And now you can begin to work with your client to try to identify what might be lurking in their background in a way that might have affected their entitlement to a passport. The final power that the Ombudsman has, which the tribunal and the court don't have, is the power to pick and choose. See, if you go to the court or the the tribunal and you make a complaint or an application, the tribunal or the court don't have any choice but to accept that complaint and determine the matter. The Ombudsman is in a different position as a result of Section 6 of the Ombudsman Act, which lists some specific reasons why the Ombudsman might not take on a matter, but then it concludes with a general power to not investigate if an investigation is not warranted having regard to all the circumstances. In the same way, the Ombudsman is also entitled to begin an investigation, but then to cease the investigation if they form the view that no further investigation is warranted. So they really are independent. So those are the special powers of the Ombudsman. Finally, in this video, I want to turn to the key restriction. I've already mentioned it in the first video this week. The Ombudsman has no power to compel any form of remedy. However, they're not entirely powerless either. The key sections are sections 15, 16 and 17 of the Ombudsman Act. Section 15 is quite long, but condensed down, what it says is that if the Ombudsman finds that there was something wrong with the administrative decision-making process or with other administrative actions, they can provide a written report to the department or the agency which made the decision. Now, on its own, Section 15 is pretty mild. It doesn't seem to have a lot of teeth. The teeth come in Section 16, which says that if the Ombudsman provides a report to the department and the department either takes no action or takes action which the Ombudsman considers is inadequate, the Ombudsman can then report that fact directly to the Prime Minister. Those teeth are sharpened further in Section 17, which says that if the Ombudsman makes a report to the Prime Minister because a department or agency has not responded adequately, the Ombudsman can also send a copy of that report to the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives so that the report can be tabled in both Houses of Parliament. That makes the report available to the political opposition, to the media and to the public. Now, put yourself in the position of the head of a public service department. Your department has made a decision. The decision has been referred to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman has investigated and found that some action needed to be taken. Let's say the decision needed to be reversed. The Ombudsman can't force you to change the decision. But you know the Ombudsman is independent. And you know that if you don't take appropriate action... This independent report, which said that your department made a bad decision, it's going to be in front of the Prime Minister, both Houses of Parliament, the political opposition and the media. In practicality, in most cases, the department is going to ensure that it responds adequately to the Ombudsman's report. So, in this video, we've learned that the Ombudsman's powers relate to a far broader range of administrative conduct than the ADJR Act does. We've learned the Ombudsman has investigative powers that go way beyond the powers that a normal applicant or any external lawyer could ever have. We've learned that the Ombudsman doesn't even need a complaint in order to commence an investigation. And we've learned that although the Ombudsman has no power to actually direct things to happen, it would be a very brave public service department that just ignored the Ombudsman's report. In the next video, we're going to start by briefly discussing some of the special purpose ombudsmen that have developed over time 
and then we're going to look at the process for making an application for the Ombudsman's assistance. See you in video three.